OK, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Robin and I'm the research data management librarian at Athabasca University Library and Scholarly Resources. And I'm here today to do a bit of an introduction to research data management best practices as with a specific focus on things that might be helpful for you in your roles with Idea Lab. So a quick overview of what will be covered. I'm going to begin with an introduction of what research data management is and its relationship to research culture and best practices in conducting research. And from there, I'll move into discussing emerging requirements for research data management in the funding landscape. And I'll then go over some research data management considerations for creating data management plans. And then I'll go into a little bit about using DMP Assistant, which is a tool for creating those plans. Altogether, this presentation is intended to provide the beginnings of a research data management best practice toolkit that can be applied to different projects. I have included slides throughout that are titled Tools and Takeaways, and these slides contain links to resources, templates, and other tools you can use. I'll put a copy of my uh, entire slide deck and this handout in the library guide to research data management and I'll put a link for that into the chat when I'm done speaking here too as well so that you have access to all of those. Okay so to begin with what is research data management? Research data management is a general term for how you plan for and carry out the handling of your data for your research project from the planning stages through data gathering, generation, active analysis, and into data deposit or long-term storage and preservation as a project is completed. This type of data management uses a life cycle approach. So research data management means planning for and carrying out processes related to data collection and documentation of that data, storing and backing up data, thinking about long-term preservation of data, any sharing or reuse of data, ethical implications about how data needs to be handled, preserved or shared, and any other responsibilities around dealing with data. For example, as a research assistant on a project, what will your responsibilities be? A data management plan can be used as a tool to document and communicate processes amongst a team. So a key thing to remember with research data management is it's not something you do after the fact once you've already collected your data. It's something that should be occurring throughout the research process. So it should be thought about and an initial plan should be drafted as the project is conceived of. Then during data collection, that plan can guide how you collect and document data while data is actively in use. Where and how you store your data is important for you and your own project, for example, having backups to avoid data loss, but also for you and your work to be in compliance with any relevant ethical and legal requirements. So for example, if you're working with human participant data with identifiers that must be kept confidential or that need to be removed from the data, or if you're working with proprietary data, those sorts of things need to be taken into consideration. After the project is completed, the data needs to be stored and preserved. If you want to or are required to share your data, you need to plan for that from the start because it is easier to share well documented and well formatted data and to do that as you go along rather than having to edit everything at the end. Good research data management is a part of doing rigorous research and contributes to research culture. It can support open scholarship by documenting processes and making them more transparent so that data can be shared and reused. This is also in keeping with open access and open research movements motivated by the desire to make publicly funded research publicly accessible. Preserving data and making it accessible for reuse when possible is also a way of recognizing the funds and efforts involved in data collection and generation. When we think about best practices in research data management, there are some principles to consider. So the Go Fair initiative promotes the fair principles which underlie research data management practices. When you're planning and carrying out your data management, you will want to consider how you can make your data fair. So fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So for findable, the first step in reusing data is to be able to find it. Data should be easy to find for both humans and computers, meaning it should be machine readable. This should be well described, having sufficient metadata and persistent identifiers. 
Data should also be accessible. Once the user finds the required data, they need to know how they can access that data, possibly including authentication or authorization if necessary. Depositing data in a trusted repository makes data more accessible to other researchers. Data should also be interoperable so that it can be integrated with other data. In addition, the data need to interoperate with applications or workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. Data should also be reusable, and that's the, the ultimate goal of FAIR, is to optimize the reuse of data. So to achieve that, metadata and data should be well described so that they can be replicated or combined in different settings. Usage permissions and provenance should also be clear. Now, the FAIR principles can be thought of as a continuum, so data can be more or less FAIR, and some of the principles may apply or be more open than others, depending on what's appropriate for your project. There are several projects in Idealab this round that plan to use or are already using open data sets, and that research would not be possible if other researchers and groups did not make their data fair. So another couple sets of principles I want to go over here are the CARE and OCAP principles, and they're important and particularly relevant if you are working with Indigenous communities or data about Indigenous peoples. They support Indigenous data sovereignty, so the care principles for Indigenous data governance are from the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, and they include collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics, where collective benefit is that data ecosystems should be designed and function in ways that enable Indigenous peoples to derive benefit from the data. Authority to control is that Indigenous peoples' rights and interests in Indigenous data must be recognized and their authority to control such data be empowered. Indigenous data governance enables Indigenous peoples and governing bodies to determine how Indigenous peoples, as well as Indigenous lands, territories, resources, knowledges, and geographic indicators are represented and identified within data. Responsibility is that those working with Indigenous data have a responsibility responsibility to share how those data are used to support Indigenous peoples' self-determination and collective benefit. Accountability requires meaningful and openly available evidence of these efforts and the benefits accruing to Indigenous peoples. And then ethics is that Indigenous peoples' rights and well-being should be the primary concern at all stages of the data life cycle and across the data ecosystem. And then in the Canadian context, we also have the principles of OCAP. And they refer, they're specifically developed by First Nations. So ownership refers to the relationship of First Nations to their cultural knowledge, data, and information. And that principle states that a community or group owns information collectively in the same way that an individual owns his or her personal information. Control affirms that First Nations, their communities, and representative bodies are within their rights in seeking to control all aspects of research and information management processes that impact them. First Nations control of research can include all stages of a particular research project from start to finish, and the principle extends to the control of resources and review processes, the planning process, management of the information, and more. Access refers to the fact that First Nations must have access to information and data about themselves and their communities regardless of where it is held. The principle of access also refers to the right of First Nations communities and organizations to manage and make decisions regarding access to their collective information. This may be achieved in practice through standardized formal protocols. And then possession. While ownership identifies the relationship between a people and their information in principle, possession or stewardship is more concrete. It refers to the physical control of data. Possession is the mechanism by which ownership can be asserted and protected. So principles like FAIR, CARE, and OCAP underlie best practices for research data management. I'm hoping that this presentation will encourage thinking about research data management as a collection of those best practices and concepts in a toolkit that can be applied or not as appropriate to particular research projects. Applying best practices and data management planning has benefits for researchers. So now some reasons that research data management in this kind of formalized sense is growing in prominence are that it can improve efficiency and organization by standardizing ways data are collected and dealt with. It can be useful to document your practices for your own and for any team members reference, which can make personnel transitions and training easier on particular projects. 
It can also help you keep track of files and what you are doing over the course of a long term project. For example, if on a research project there are multiple student research assistants or other data managers who come through the project, it's helpful to have documentation about just what needs to be done with the data and by whom. For graduate students and research assistants, a data management plan can be an excellent communication tool between the student or research assistant and supervisor or principal investigator. And it can be used alongside the research or project proposal as a foundation for documenting how data will be handled during the research project. Research data management also supports increasing visibility and recognition for work with data. You can plan for a data set to be preserved and made accessible in a repository, which also allows for that data to be cited so other researchers can use that data and credit you. This can contribute to you establishing your program of research and your voice as a researcher. Research data management is also important on a larger scale by making a contribution to the movement towards open scholarship with that potential for data reuse, and it increases trust in research by supporting the replicability and transparency of studies. Using research data management best practices will also help to comply with different stakeholder policies. Funders, institutions, and publications like journals can each have their own policies related to data management, data retention, and data sharing. You will need to be aware of and plan for how you will comply with any policies relevant to you. So from this first section, I've got a few takeaway tools and resources here. Uh, one is a link to our library guide to research data management, which has an overview and most of these links in it itself. So whether you prefer to access them from the handout from this webinar or just go to the guide is up to you. I've also linked in the Digital Research Alliance of Canada Research Data Management Teams training materials and their Zenodo library, which includes links to brief guides, primers, data management plan exemplars and templates and more. And that's those are resources from a national body here within Canada. I've also included links to a couple of data management guides by Eugene Barsky from UBC and the Good Enough Research Data Management Guide is also a good place to start. And here as well are links to the FAIR principles as well as the CARE and OCAP principles. So in the, the next section of the presentation, I'm going to cover a bit about the emerging research data management requirements and what that landscape is like here in Canada. So institutions, publishers, funders, and associations at various levels can formally recognize the importance of good research data management and data sharing as part of research culture through the provision of guidance and adoption of policies. This means that researchers need to be aware of recommendations and requirements from various entities that could apply to their projects. These requirements may be from their home institutions and research ethics boards, from the journal they wish to publish in, from their research funder or funders, or other stakeholders. In the Canadian context, the Tri-Agency Research Data Management Policy is of particular importance, and it's of importance for researchers in Idea Lab as well, because some of them may be looking towards building their projects into for future grant applications, and some of those could be through Tri-Agency funding calls. So just briefly to go over what's important from the tri agency policy, it was released in March of 2021 and has several requirements that are being phased in. At the institutional level, AU is currently working on having an institutional strategy that will be publicly posted by March of 2023, and that will detail how the institution plans to support its researchers in good research data management practice. Of more importance for you as research assistants in Idea Lab are the requirements for researchers. So for researchers, data management plans or DMPs and data deposit will be required. The requirement for data management plans will be piloted and an initial set of funding opportunities that will be subject to the requirement will be announced this spring. The data deposit requirement will be phased in after institutional strategies have been reviewed. So that'll be after March of 2023. However, it's important to note that there are existing policies already that could affect some researchers. So for example, CIHR, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, have requirements that apply to all projects funded from 2008 onwards for certain data types. 
So for a little more detail from the policy, data management plans involve describing how data will be collected, documented, formatted, protected, and preserved, how existing data sets will be used, and what new data will be created over the course of the research project, whether and how data will be shared, and where data will be deposited. And standardized tools for creating those plans are encouraged, and we'll go into that in a bit more depth later in this webinar. Data deposit involves all data, metadata, and code being deposited in a recognized repository for safe storage, curation, and preservation. That repository and the researcher should be providing access where ethical, legal, and commercial requirements allow and according to any disciplinary standards. So some data types, researchers may have signed research agreements or data access agreements, or they may have other ethical responsibilities that may prevent full data sharing. So those are important to take into consideration. And if possible, a data should be linked to publications that arise from it with persistent digital identifiers. So there are some other related policies and statements that come into play here. The tri agency before putting in its research data management policy had a statement of principles on digital data management that they released in 2016. And that statement includes research data management expectations and responsibilities for institutions, researchers and funders. For researchers, the responsibilities arising from the expectations in the document include using research data data management best practices in their research, developing data management plans that address the entire life cycle of a research project and beyond, and following applicable policies at their institutions or adopted by their funders, acknowledging and citing data sets and staying current of standards or expectations in their disciplines. So we're going to go over some of those basic things in this presentation today. CIHR also had its own open access policy in 2013 and the requirements in that were included in the 2015 tri-agency open access policy on publications. Those requirements apply to any CIHR funded project from 2008 onwards and some of those specific requirements relate to data such as data sets must be kept for a minimum of five years after the end of the grant whether the data is published or not and bioinformatics, atomic and molecular coordinate data must be deposited in the appropriate public database immediately upon publication of results. And there is actually an annex on the policy with examples of appropriate repositories. SHRC also had a data archiving policy. Um, and it was in commitment to the principle that research data collected with public funds belongs in the public domain. So the and that policy allowed for researchers to include costs of preparing data for deposit in their funding applications. So that could again be important for researchers in Idea Lab who could be working towards future funding applications to remember that because of these policies coming into place, some of the the need for funding those processes for having someone clean and prepare data for deposit can now be written into grant applications. And so just to kind of come back around and summarize, common research data management requirements that are um, coming into place through different policies from different areas are for data deposit or data sharing and to have data management plans submitted as a part of a funding application. So in relation to a particular project, you need to check, does your funder have any general research data management policies? Does the specific call for funding have any research data management related requirements? And do you have a target venue for publication? And does that particular venue, so journal or publisher, require or recommend data deposit? Because you may need to format your data in a way that makes it depositable in, a, in any repository that they recommend. Or if they don't re require a specific repository, you'll want to format it for whatever repository you choose. So some takeaway tools and resources here. I've linked in the tri agency policy documents that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, as well as a link to, and it's, it's a Word doc, so it takes you to a page where you can download the Word document, but it's from the states, from the National Science Foundation, where Johns Hopkins kind of created a grant reviewer worksheet for evaluating data management plans.
So now I'm going to get into data management planning a little more specifically and some considerations for what needs to go into that data management plan. So again, a data management plan is an actual document that describes how data will be collected, documented, formatted, protected, and preserved. It talks about how existing data sets will be used, what new data will be created over the course of a research project, whether or how data can be shared, or where that data will be deposited. It is a living document that you can update as needed or as a project evolves. So how data management plans will actually be evaluated in upcoming funding competitions is yet to be fully developed, but it will be based on planning to implement best practices throughout the research data lifecycle. So now to get into some general considerations that should be addressed in a data management plan. I'm going to talk a little more about ethics. So if you want to or are required to share your data, it needs to be planned for from the start. If you have human participants, they need to be notified and consent to data being released. This is typically done on the consent form when participants consent to participate in a study. How you intend to use the data and whether or not it can be reused and deposited is determined by the language in your information and consent documents. So ideally, you should try to make your data as open as possible, but as closed as necessary if you can't get that consent. The tri-agency policy statement on ethical conduct for research involving humans, usually shortened to TCPS2, outlines some considerations for ethical conduct of research and has chapters specifically related to privacy and confidentiality, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada, qualitative research, clinical trials, human biological materials, and human genetic research, and some of those do touch on data linkage and things like that. So it's an important document to review as you're thinking about any data sharing requirements. So some tools and resources related to ethics and sensitive data include the TCPS2, and then the Portage Network, which has now been renamed to Alliance Research Data Management, has released a three-part toolkit with three PDF documents. Uh, the links are to the English versions of the documents, but they're also available in French, and those include a glossary of terms used when talking about sensitive data, a human participant research data risk matrix, which can be used to determine risk level and make decisions about data management and appropriate places to store data. They also created a document providing samples of research data management language for informed consent. So if you're thinking about data deposit, that one is a really important one to review because it actually gives sample language that can be included on the consent form. They've also put together some de-identification guidance as a part of a larger set of documents uh, related to sharing and COVID-19 research, but the de-identification guidance is relevant to any type of data project looking at de-identification. And the Future of Privacy Forum has created a really nice poster style visual of different types of de-identification uh, use of pseudonyms, fully anonymous data that can be useful to review just to kind of get a sense of different types of data and identifiers and what types of things might need to be done in order to make that data more safe to be deposited if you're trying to assure confidentiality of your participants. So next we have data storage and documentation. You need to plan for how you will collect, store, and analyze data. Consider data security and ethics requirements. So you should document the following in a data management plan, and that includes data collection protocols, so when and how data will be migrated from collection devices to storage and who will do so, how files and folders will be named, where data will be stored and what privacy measures are in place, how files and versioning will be handled, and then you also want to get into process or processes for transferring data, how data will be protected, backed up, and where. And if you're working with human participant data, that information also needs to go on your ethics application form. Um, you need to consider who needs to access the data, and that can include different members of the team and how they need to access it, whether or not they're from your institution, and whether or not they may be in different countries and have data subject to different jurisdictional rules. You need to think about how data will be described and documented and whether or not any metadata standards are relevant. 
So discussing data security, encryption, and backup options with IT is always a really good idea as they are equipped to speak to all the technical aspects. And institutions often negotiate contracts with service providers that are generally considered better than using any free cloud service account. Identifiable data should not be put in a free cloud account. And this is where Idea Lab has a distinct advantage because there will be consultation with IT and AWS consultants for projects. So projects within Idea Lab may be working out these processes as they go, and that's fine. A data management plan doesn't have to be set in stone at the start of a project. It can be returned to and updated and can actually be used as a tool to start thinking about what needs to be in place in those initial steps. So an initial data management plan might use phrasing like consultation with AUIT and AWS will be undertaken to determine the appropriate computing infrastructure and security for this project. AU's contracted AWS cloud services will be used as well as 0365 and AU computer workstations. You can then confirm with IT as the project develops and update the data management plan because ideally you want to be able to record what the computing infrastructure that was used was so that it could be replicated in future projects, especially if researchers are thinking about doing small projects with an idea lab that they're going to upscale into larger grant applications. And again, a key piece to consider is data security needs, which may be based on ethics requirements for human participants or other obligations, such as intellectual property, other forms of research agreements, and any partnerships that may have non-disclosure agreements or other requirements coming into place. So now for data storage and documentation, a lot of this could be in your data management plan or stored in a plain text readme file on your computer or on in the cloud where the data is stored so that that information is stored beside the data itself. So now getting into a little more into the weeds here, thinking about file naming, you want to consider having standardized file names for a project. And there's the key thing here is to be descriptive and consistent. So you want to develop and record your conventions for naming and storage that typically goes in a data management plan and then folder structures can be outlined in a readme file. So for file naming, you want to consider including project or experiment names or an acronym, the location or spatial coordinates, researcher name or initials, which can also be important to you have multiple researchers on a project and need to keep track of who was collecting which data, date or date range of an experiment or data collection, the type of data, any other important conditions, and then if you're not using a versioning system, you may need to be including version numbers in the file names themselves. And then there's some other tips. So you want to document those file naming practices and structures. Avoid using special characters because those can become problematic in different operating systems. Do not use spaces in file names, so use underscores or camel case. Use a year, 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 month, month, date, date format, day, day format, or um, I prefer to put dashes in between those because it's a little more human readable. The computer doesn't necessarily need those for sorting, but I find it hard to read that many numbers in a row for my own parsing of the data. And then I've got a couple of examples here. So where I have the, the date of the file, I have the group code and then the data type in these names. So this is where a fairly small project where all of the different groups were given a kind of pseudonym code by a flower. And then the data was collected and handled in multiple ways because there was both audio backups of video data. There was video data collected both from webcams and from video cameras. So those had to be differentiated. And then all of that data was also transcribed. That's just a quick example of different ways you can name files. And the other piece I want to show at this point, which I'm going to escape out of my presentation momentarily, is an example of a readme file. So this, the link to this template is in the takeaway handout for this presentation. But what a readme file does is it lists out the basic information that is needed to interpret a data set. And it's also often required by different repositories if you're thinking about where data is going to be deposited at the, at the end of a project. So it'll go over things like people who are affiliated with the data set, how data was collected, where, 
any other information about sources, any licensing, and some of those things may not be able to be answered at the outset of the project, but they're things to keep in mind. And I've also got a sample from a DRI survey that we're doing internally here. So the shared files for the project are all listed out here. And then in the readme file, we have all of the team members listed. And then there's just a quick overview of a file directory. Now, if you're working on a fairly complex project with a lot of files, having to label them all out into the readme file might be a bit much, but you may want to have something that just states what type of files are held in each folder, because then from there, people can use that in combination with your file naming procedures to know, oh yeah, this is the most recent version of this file, and I go and get it from this folder. So those are kind of useful places to start, and that readme file if you go to deposit your data will be very important for the repositories to understand and be able to ensure that the data is appropriately described and it's also important for anyone going to reuse the data because then they know what all the files are how they were collected and how they might be able to reuse them okay i'm just going to come back to my slide deck here So the takeaway tools and resources related to file naming, documentation, and storage include, so the file naming advice I just went over is also included in the AU Library Guide for Research Data Management. There is a metadata directory maintained by the Research Data Alliance community, and that includes the ability to browse standards by disciplinary area, uh, view use cases for different metadata standards and explore tools. So sometimes data needs to be described and organized in ways that metadata standards can be applied to, to make them more machine readable. Um, and use of particular standards are more prominent in some disciplines than others. I've also included links to uh, the Federated Research Data Repositories readme template, which is very similar to Cornell's guidance and the template I showed on screen just a moment ago. There's also a link here because this was also a little bit about data storage to Alliance Advanced Research Computing, which used to be Compute Canada, uh, which may be a service that some researchers are familiar with that has offers some advanced research computing options, data storage and backup. So it would be just an additional alter alternative that is available at a national level. Okay, so then getting more into data deposit. Although not yet a requirement from that tri-agency policy, data deposit and sharing contributes to open scholarship. Uh, not all data may be able to be made open or deposited in full, but it's important to consider from the outset of a project. And for projects going on in Idea Lab or anything using or creating code, that tri-agency policy requires that data and code be deposited. So I really wanna highlight that here. So when you're thinking about data deposit, it's going to a digital repository and deposit is in theory making that data more fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So there are different types of repositories. These include disciplinary, institutional, and generalist repositories. Disciplinary repositories are ones that have been established for a particular subject or subset of a subject area. Um, it's a good idea to use that as your first option if there's a recognized repository in your discipline, because your data will be more likely to be found and reused by people in your field. Uh, many institutions also have their own repositories for data. And just note, AU does not currently have a data repository, but is working towards having one as we work on our institutional strategy. And then generalist repositories are non-discipline specific. They typically will take data of any type. So the Federated Research Data Repository is an example of a Canadian option for medium to large data sets with a default storage allocation of one terabyte. Um, and there are some other common repositories as well. Things like Zenodo is a common one people have heard of. So when selecting a repository for your data set, you want to consider fit for your project and discipline, curation. Some repositories are curated and will have criteria your data needs to meet before deposit. Curators can work with you to help make your data more fair. Um, you also want to find a repository that is issuing persistent identifiers. 
So most repositories should provide you with an identifier like a DOI, digital object identifier, which makes your data easier to find and cite. And some journals are now requiring that your data be deposited somewhere and that you can submit that DOI alongside of your manuscript before they will publish. So whether or not a repository will issue a pers persistent identifier is something you may want to check in advance. And then preservation, not all repositories are necessarily intended for long term preservation, so you will want to check if they have established commitments to preserve data for a specified time period. And that time period may be determined based on continued value of the data set over time. Some repositories may also be certified uh, to be compliant with a particular set of standards. So examples of standards include the core trust seal trustworthy data repository requirements, which is specific to data repositories, and then a trusted digital repository designation, which is not specific to data repositories. So some takeaway tools and resources for data repositories deposit include repository options in Canada, which was a guide put together by Portage, the Federated Research Data Repository, the Registry of Research Data Repositories, which is actually a searchable registry of repositories where you can go and look to find repositories that may re be relevant to your project or discipline, and then the Portage recommended repositories for COVID-19 data. So lastly here, I wanted to get into a little bit about the actual creation of a data management plan. So for this part, I'm going to go in and just show a little bit about the platform because for the last round in Idea Lab, there were several research projects where they actually went in and created plans within this system. And they either had the RA do initial drafts of the plan or the principal investigator did an initial draft and then had the RA collaborate, especially around questions related to data storage and backup. So I'm just going to escape out here. Oh, so DMP Assistance is a it's a national platform, so it's maintained by the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, which now incorporates the Portage network. Anyone can go in and create an account to do so just on this tab here, make sure you type in and include your organization, so Athabasca University, because that will actually give you access to a request feedback feature inside the platform if you want to connect with me to have a review a data management plan. So I'm just going to quickly sign in here. or maybe not so quickly. There we go. OK, so once you're in the system, any plans you have created, you'll see in your dashboard. And then you can go in to create a plan. When you indicate and again, indicating your organization is helpful because then you'll get the request feedback feature. I'm not going to hit create plan in here. Because I don't want to make another mock one. I'm going to go back out, but I'll just show here. That there is a drop down menu of templates available. And these are available both within the system and as PDFs outside of the system if you want to review them in advance. So and I'll go over links for that in a moment here. Just to back up to my dashboard. I'm going to go into one of the sample plans I've created. So creating a plan, just there's a space to put in basic information about the project. Um, information about the contributors. And then the plan overview tab will list out all of the sections and questions in that plan template. And then whether or not you have a right plan tab here or several tabs that say things like phase one, phase two, phase three will depend on the template you've chosen because some of the templates are phased and have multiple tabs of questions instead of having them all in one like this basic template here does. So the portage template is a good basic place to start, but there are a couple of other ones that will be relevant to idea lab projects that I'll highlight here as well. 
So plans typically include all the things we've talked about, data collection, documentation, metadata, storage and backup, preservation, sharing and reuse, responsibilities and resources, and then ethics and compliance. You're also able to set up sharing. So you can add in, have both PIs, research assistants, any other team members able to access the data management plan, and then you can set whether or not they're a co-owner, editor, or only have read, have read only access. The request feedback feature I mentioned before is right here. If you hit that button, that sends an email to the library, and then I know to go in and I can add comments on your plan. So what that looks like is when you're inside the template, your answers will have gone here. And then anyone, collaborators, or if you request feedback from me, can add comments on the side. So that can be a way to have a bit of a discussion going that doesn't end up actually in your answer box. Because what you're also able to do here, if you want to, is download the plan out of the system. As And the formats that are most likely to be relevant here would be the PDF or the Word document. Um, so that could be relevant if you're downloading it out to share with other team members who aren't wanting to be in the platform. If you need to submit it to a funding body or submitting it somewhere else for review, you can download it out that way. The comments on the side don't show up there, just the answer boxes do. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of what's available within that system. And then I'm going to bring my slides back up here. lagging a little bit. There we go. So there are some additional resources available here. So I've included a link to DMP Assistant in the, the takeaway handout. There are also exemplars that have been developed by what was the Portage Network and is now called Alliance Research Data Management. Um, so the, these are examples with actual answers in the data management plans. So there are several related to digital humanities, mixed methods research, uh, social sciences research, and then natural sciences. And I'm going to highlight there is a reproducibility and high performance computing example, which could be useful for some of the researchers using different AWS resources. What's also available. Oh, and those links showed up awkwardly. Um, but anyway, th there are also templates for, these are the same templates that are in the DMP Assistant platform itself, but the versions available here are actual PDFs. It's gonna load. Um, that they're PDF versions so that if it's a little easier to page through that way, or if you want to look at PDFs of a couple different ones before deciding which one you want to create, you can do that here as well. And they go through th underneath each question. That text there shows up in a guidance box beside each answer space in the platform itself so that you can see the suggestions and things they have there. And again, I highlighted the advanced research computing template as well because there were a couple of projects last round that found that one useful because some of the questions within it asked things related to making the, the platform and the things they were using reproducible. So from there. I'm just going to, uh, that's the end of me talking and I'm going to ask if anyone has questions or anything like that. And I'm going to escape out of the slides and put the link to the library guide and which also has the slide deck and takeaway handout in it in the chat window here. <laughs>